Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. It may seem like host Ryan Seacrest is pretty much everywhere these days, in addition to his morning radio show and helming American Idol, Seacrest has a new credit on his resume, hosting Wheel of Fortune. Our Luke Burbank caught up with him in Los Angeles. Wheel of Fortune? That's a house constructed by its creator, Merv Griffin, and meticulously maintained by host Pat Sajak for over four decades. And now Seacrest has to figure out the floor plan, including the rules of the game which actually took a lot of practice, he says. Um, wherever I was working, um, the producers sometimes would come and they bring contestants and we would play Wheel of Fortune in hotels just to get familiar with the rules and scenarios and things that can happen so that at some point it becomes second nature. Later in the show, Ryan Seacrest on the opportunity to spin the wheel. Presumably at some point watched Wheel of Fortune. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I guess my question is, does this feel the way you thought it would feel? No, this is, I, I never pictured this, these jobs, um, these incredible opportunities that were built. I mean, it's like, it's like you're walking into a, a home that has been built and people have lived there and they've hosted their friends for many, many years and you walk in and you just want to get a coaster to put your drink down so you don't leave a stain on the coffee table. You know, you're just so excited to be there and careful with all of it. Um, and these are the list of people that I look up to. Each one of these jobs that I've had a chance to come in to do, I've looked up to the people who were there before me. We stay in California for our next story, too, where entrepreneur Nargis Habib is on a mission to help lift women in Afghanistan out of extreme poverty, one hand-knotted rug at a time. The Taliban, who retook control of the country back in 2021, forbid women to study past sixth grade or work outside their homes. But Habib, who grew up in Afghanistan, is creating opportunities for women to be paid livable wages and provide for their families, all from the safety of their home. The women that don't have a man to support them or don't have sons to support them, they're starving. And so now these women have to find sources of work within the confines of their homes. They're beautiful. This is where Nargis and her rugs come in. She started buying rugs from female artisans in Afghanistan. Oh, wow, look at the colors. And selling them out of her garage in San Diego. She called the business the rug mine. The hope is a centuries old Afghan tradition might help solve today's problems. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Ryan Seacrest says he arrived in Hollywood with just one dream and just one contact, and that was in the radio business. Today, in addition to his many other gigs, he's filling Pat Sajak's shoes as host of Wheel of Fortune. Here's Luke Burbank. Wheel of Fortune! Just a heads up, America. When you turn on your TV, something is going to be different. I can't wait to get to work. Oh, let's get you ready for- Yes, after 40 plus years, Wheel of Fortune has a new host. Grab those devices. Time for the first toss-up. Who is himself sort of an institution in America. He's the guy who seems to host everything these days, Ryan Seacrest. Can you please list the jobs that you currently have? Let's start with the beginning of the year. New Year's Eve, the ball drops, that starts the year. Happy New Year! It is 12 degrees and it feels like zero. American Top 40. This one, new on the chart at 32. On air with Ryan Seacrest, in the mornings on KISS FM. 7.39 in the morning. And then syndicated across the country. American Idol and Wheel of Fortune. And then some specials here and there. Wheel of Fortune, distributed by CBS, is the latest and possibly the most high profile job for Seacrest, who grew up in tiny Dunwoody, Georgia, where even as a kid, he kept very busy. Believe it or not, I played high school football. What position? I played strong safety. I was stronger, but not that strong. I didn't play a lot, but I practiced a lot. I practiced so much, but played less in the games. But high school football in Georgia is no it's a joke. Deal. It's a big, it's a big, that's my excuse. But of course, you can't get much further from Hollywood than Dunwoody, Georgia, something that was not lost on Seacrest. 
Always wanted to do this. Always dreamt of being on the air. I would listen to Casey Kasem. Hello again, and welcome to American Top 40. My name's Casey Kasem. I'm mowing the lawn on uh, my Walkman, you know, headphones, and um, I would picture what it would be like to be in Hollywood. How, how did you make your way to Los Angeles? In my Honda Prelude. Really? Uh, yeah. I packed my things in my Honda from Atlanta, and I came out to L.A. I had uh, one contact at a radio station at the time called Star 98.7, which was loosely affiliated with the station I worked at in Atlanta. I met the program director eventually. I remember coming home to my apartment in Burbank every day, playing my answer machine, like hitting the microtape, waiting for his voice. Eventually, the call did come, leading to radio success, and then the show that changed his life. American Idol. We're down to two. Clay Aiken and Ruben Stutter head to head. The showdown tonight on American Idol. I know the DNA of that show. I mean, that's the house where I go into. It's like, oh, we built that bathroom. I know that door squeaky, and we need to, you know, if you want to use, go over here for the the spoons and the silverware. Like, you, I sort of know that world really well. Now, America, it's all up to you. Everything that I do has has, a, has somebody that's a bigger star or a supporting group. And it's not about me, it's about a contestant, it's about a story, it's about something else or someone else. And I think that does make me feel a little bit more comfortable. Give the wheel a final spin. Ask Meanwhile, Wheel of Fortune, that's a house constructed by its creator, Merv Griffin, and meticulously maintained by host Pat Sajak for over four decades. And now Seacrest has to figure out the floor plan, including the rules of the game, which actually took a lot of practice, he says. Um, wherever I was working, um, the producers sometimes would come and they bring contestants and we would play Wheel of Fortune in hotels just to get familiar with the rules and scenarios and things that can happen so that at some point it becomes second nature. In the early tapings we watched, <laughs> Seacrest seemed comfortable in the role of host and co-collaborator with the TV royalty that is Vanna White. I've known Ryan for probably 20 years, but um, in the past couple of months, we've done some traveling together for the show, and we got to know each other a little better too, so I think our chemistry is good. What do you think? I mean, it looked like you've been doing this forever together, so were you nervous about that element, the chemistry, because there's no accounting for that, right? That's so true. I had no idea what to expect. I mean, when I'm used to one person for so long, I was very scared, but it's, he's, he's doing a great job. This is such an incredible, special franchise. It's more than a TV show. It is something that means something to people. And when I found out that this was an opportunity for me, I, there was no thought to this. It was like, absolutely, let's figure it out and let's get started. Of course, figuring it out meant fitting it into his famously packed schedule, which occasionally does include some downtime for recharging. And for Seacrest, that's always happened at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where these days he's on the board of trustees. Why is that something that you want to take up even more of your time with? It's, it's, not, it's not a job. It's, uh, it's a, a way to escape it, you know? It's like you walk through this museum and you forget about all the things that are going on in the world and you have a chance to look at the different works that are on display here. Like, does this feel like a long way from Georgia? It does, and interestingly, this is right across the street from the E Entertainment building that used to be. It's now over at Universal, but when I was working at E, I was on the radio in the morning, I was doing E News, I was hosting live from the red carpet. Nominated for Best Original, Lady Gaga. And I would walk across the street here to LACMA, and just take a deep breath and walk around. I always came back reinvigorated. It was there for me, so I'm trying to be here for it. You both make it look so easy. Well, you're never going to find a better job, and you're never going to find a better co-host. Aw, thanks, Pat. Do you feel like you now have reached peak Ryan Seacrest and do not need to take on any more jobs? I don't know if I've reached peak me, but I feel like I've reached, for the moment, um, fully occupied me. Uh, I don't think I should take on another job right now. I want to get... I want this one to go so well. I want all of them to go well, but this one's new, and I want this one to be something that people go, okay, you know what? I get it. That makes sense. That's what Merv said to me. He goes, the beauty of Wheel of Fortune is the kind of show you can sit in front of the TV or have on in the background and play along or yell at a contestant if they're not getting it, and you've got it before them. I mean, that's what this show is. 
After the break, an exclusive excerpt from Luke Burbank's chat with Ryan Seacrest. Something you can only see right here. Here comes the sun. Stay with us. One day I want to eat very late and sleep very late. As promised, here's more of Luke Burbank's interview with Ryan Seacrest. You feel like that's one of your main talents you bring to this is the ability to just do so many things and do them all well and somehow keep it all kind of straight in your mind? I guess I had to find my niche, right? I, I think that... Uh, I'm, your niche I'm, was doing everything? My niche is saying yes. <laughs> I, do, I, I do find it exciting to be able to shift gears throughout the course of the day or week. You know, coming off of a, an idle live on a Sunday night into a Wheel of Fortune taping the next day is exciting to me. Uh, in between that, a radio show, taking calls, playing hit music. I find that rhythm, for whatever reason, I don't want to say relaxing, but it's a comfort zone. Presumably, at some point, watched Wheel of Fortune. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I guess my question is, does this feel the way you thought it would feel? No, this is, I, I never pictured this, these jobs, um, these incredible opportunities that were built. I mean, it's like, it's like you're walking into a, a home that has been built and people have lived there and they've hosted their friends for many, many years and you walk in and you just want to get a coaster to put your drink down so you don't leave a stain on the coffee table. You know, you're just so excited to be there and careful with all of it. Um, and these are the list of people that I look up to. Each one of these jobs that I've had a chance to come in to do, I've looked up to the people who were there before me. What's it like being a public person like you are? Did you sort of factor that in when you wanted to do this work? Did you consider what that would be like? I mean, just having, being a celebrity, having people know you, having people curious about you. It's different for me, in my view, of being a public person uh, than a, a, an actor or a movie star. My experience is, and I love this, people feel like they know me. And they're not in awe of me at all. They're actually, and this I think is a compliment, pretty comfortable to come up and start chatting with me. And I chat right back with them. Sometimes I wonder, have we met? And in most cases we haven't met, but I don't mind it. I'm, I'm actually a people person and I like uh, that someone might say, hey, you know, my, my daughter and I didn't really have much to talk about until American Idol came on the air. And then we watched together every week and we voted together or since wheel has happened it's incredible the cultural impact it's more than a tv show it's had such an impact on american culture and i get to see that with people too now is there something about ryan seacrest that people might be surprised to find out something you like something you don't like something i like or something i don't like Just a surprising fact about you i mean high school football honestly i didn't know that one that's a pretty good one right yeah um you have to ask people around me what would, what would be surprising well, I'll let you I, think on that. How about this? Are you, I'm not a morning person. Is that true? <laughs> I mean, I'm forced to be now, but I'm really not. I think if I were not, I do like to get things done now, but I think if I didn't work in this world, I would love to sleep till like, I always got very jealous of people that would sleep till 9, 9.30. They could sleep and sleep to that hour. So, and, and one day I want to eat very late and sleep very late. I do like the radio, but... I'm fascinated by people who will say to me, you want to have dinner at 9? No, I cannot have dinner at 9. You want to have dinner at 4.30? The answer is no, of course. They don't want to have dinner at 4.30. Are, are you going to just keep going with this pretty much as long as you can? As far as just the wheel, you just got this job. Yeah. But I mean, generally speaking, keeping the schedule, being this present in this many things. I think now it's in a good place. It's in a place where the geography is, is good. Um, the, 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 the roles are exciting for me. The roles... I feel fit, um, what I like to do. So I think this is, this is kind of like, okay, this is a good moment to sit back and just try and do all of this well. Who knows what happens in a few years. Up next, making a difference, one knot at a time. Welcome back. Entrepreneur Nargis Habib lives thousands of miles and a world away from Afghanistan. That's where she grew up. But she remains connected by a thread, you might say, with the women who live there, many of whom are living in poverty. Through her business, Rug Mine, Habib buys traditional handmade Afghan rugs from female artisans and then sells them, providing those women with a source of income. Tracy Smith visited Habib in her San Diego home, where she stores much of the inventory 
in her garage. Every morning, Nargis Habib and her family have the same routine, making breakfast. Good morning. Good morning. Packing lunches. Are you ready? A hug and kiss from dad, then off to school. An ordinary day that we all tend to take for granted. Oh, so that's cute. cute. Do you get in that mode, because I know I do as a mom, where yeah. you kind of lose perspective about how lucky you are? Bye. Bye. Have a good day at school. Our minds are so occupied with everyday things, the routine, being so busy that you forget that it's actually a privilege. Look at all these. But she has a reminder every time she steps into her garage. Okay, I would say like 400, 500, 1,000. It's filled with rugs from her home country, a memory from when she was a little girl. You grew up surrounded by rugs. Absolutely. Nargis grew up in 1990s Taliban-controlled Afghanistan when girls were barred from school. But she and her sisters took classes, hiding in a basement, seated on piles of Afghan rugs. We were all around a teacher in a dark basement, studying in fear and secret. But it was the rugs that gave us that warmth and coziness and home feeling. In 2001, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan and kicked out the Taliban. But when the U.S. withdrew in 2021, the Taliban came back into power. By then, Nargis had immigrated to America, but her mother, brother, and younger sister remained there. For the safety of Nargis's family, we cannot show their faces. Her sister was studying to become a doctor. That dream is all but impossible now. Girls from first to sixth grade can attend school, but after sixth grade, they must stop and stay at home. Adita Arya is the executive director of the Afghan Literacy Foundation, an NGO that has helped more than 3,000 Afghan families send their kids to school. But with more than half the population in danger of starvation, she says education becomes a casualty for girls and boys. If you don't have enough food on the table, literacy just goes out the door. You're just trying to survive from one day to the next. So a lot of these families are saying, no school for you, help me find food. Today, more than one million children in Afghanistan, some as young as six years old, are working. Little boys are saying, can you please help me because I'm going to be sent to the unforgiven streets of Kabul to work. We have others reporting that their teenage sisters will be married off for the dowry money or to be able to feed the rest of the family at an early age. Families are making devastating choices in order to guarantee their survival on a daily basis. Just to feed their kids. Just to be able to feed their kids, yeah. And with the Taliban restricting women from working and leaving their homes, their options are even more dire. The women that don't have a man to support them or don't have sons to support them, they're starving. And so now these women have to find sources of work within the confines of their homes. They're beautiful. This is where Nargis and her rugs come in. She started buying rugs from female artisans in Afghanistan. Oh, wow, oh, the colors. And selling them out of her garage in San Diego. She called the business the rug mine. The hope is a centuries old Afghan tradition might help solve today's problems. From the comfort of their homes, they're making rugs and they're getting paid for that. Nargis has a contract with each of her artisans that they're paid above the fair and livable wage for their work. In return, they promise not to employ child workers. How much of a difference can getting a job making rugs do for a woman or a family in Afghanistan? It makes a huge difference. It provides them financial freedom. Now, if they can't send their daughters to school, at least they're able to send their sons to school. Now four years old, the rug mine has worked with over 4,000 female Afghan artisans and has paid them over half a million dollars. The company sells more than 600 rugs a year and now has a showroom where you can see their ancient handiwork up close. These colors are gorgeous. The rugs sell for as low as $100 to as high as $11,000. Each rug can take three to five months to make. 
the thread is spun, naturally dyed with fruits and vegetables, woven and tied into thousands of tiny knots. And each of these knots is hand tied. Yeah. The rugs are then washed. The backside burned to get the sheen just right. It's a painstaking process with a beautiful result. Nargis went back to Afghanistan last summer to hand deliver a pay bonus to each of her artisans. Her daughters came with her and answered questions from other girls their age. They asked my daughters if they're allowed to go to school. And when I saw those girls, it reminded me of me and my sisters. It truly broke my heart for those young girls. You obviously can't change that. No. But do you feel like in some way what you're doing makes a difference? If I'm changing a family's life by paying them just a little bit more, then they're able to change their kid's life. With the little changes here and there, it makes a huge difference in Afghanistan. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here next time on Here Comes the Sun.